Welcome to Fridays with Fintelect. My guest today is Colin Camp, Senior Director, Business Development and Sales, APAC at Pelican. Colin has over 35 years of financial industry and 25 years of technology experience at executive, managerial and consultancy roles across sales, business development, territory management and strategy. Colin's career now is focused on utilizing the benefits of artificial intelligence to automate, streamline and improve operational and compliance processes for financial services institutions. He has worked across Europe, USA and the Asia Pacific regions, giving him a deep understanding of the various cultures and working practices in these diverse geographies. Colin, welcome to Fridays with Fintelect. Thank you, Shavish. Uh, good to be here. Thank you. Colin, to start with, may I ask you, uh, what are the new trends that you have noticed in the world of technology, especially in the application of artificial intelligence against financial crime? And have you seen any visible deviation in these trends since the onslaught of the pandemic? Yeah, I, I, I suppose the, the, the biggest trend over the recent years has, has really been around data. Just the, the sheer amount of data that's now available uh, to, to banks or to institutions around the world. I, mean, I think that the new saying is that uh, data is, is the new oil and that's just what's going to drive the world going forward. Uh, and this is because of the new technology, the new hardware. Um, so there's huge amounts of data and this data, especially when we're talking about financial crime compliance, this data can be mined, interrogated, really to spot any sort of indications of, of financial crime. So just the sheer amount of data we've got uh, enables us to certainly improve our financial crime compliance. But the, the issue is when I mean, just having all this data available isn't enough. So you've got piles and piles of data. Um, it's almost like having, having lots of oil without any machinery to use it. Okay, so we've got the data. So this is where technology such as artificial intelligence comes on board. And we've gone through, a, since sort of 60s, sort of the story or the history or journey of artificial intelligence, it's now a technology that's very mature. Um, so now, because it's just physically impossible for, for a human to just look at the amount of data available, certainly within sort of timeframes where we're now all working on, um, this is where we now need to start using the, the different technology. And especially the technology we've got, it, it comes in all different formats. It's all, um, potentially a lot of it is unformatted. So how do you put it all together uh, in order to actually drill down and to put spot if there's any uh, anomalies as such? Uh, and, and if you then look at sort of taking it step forward to the, to the artificial intelligence uh, era, we've, we've all been using artificial intelligence in our daily lives for a number of years. We, we probably use it. We don't even realize we, we're using it. Um, we can't get by with our normal sort of daily life without using artificial intelligence now. So it, it's almost puzzling to a certain extent that, why do we use it so much in our personal life? Why do we rely on it so much in our personal life? Well, we don't then bring it into the benefits of our business life and, and use it to help us in the business life. And I know there's certainly, been certainly on the front office, client facing tools, there's a lot of AI, you know, bots, et cetera. But I think over recent years, we're seeing a lot more of use of artificial intelligence in, in, in compliance side, uh, which I think is, is sort of driving uh, the cost savings that we're seeing. Um, so, so when we're looking at again natural language uh, with uh, artificial intelligence, we're looking at natural language processing, which is giving the facility to read documents, messaging, files, in exactly the same way as a human being can do. And we're looking at machine learning to really dr drill down and to build models uh, on that to analyze the historical data and the real-time data to again to identify any anomalies as such. Uh, so this is improving our accuracy of the checks. Uh, reducing the number of false positives. So you know, I think if you speak to almost every compliance officer in every institution of the globe across the world, the, the one major thing that they're, they're going to be complaining about is, is the number of false positives uh, that they're experiencing just because of having to check all this data. So using artificial intelligence, we can improve that, reduce the cost, which again, which is driving a lot of compliance officers across the globe as well. Um, so uh, and I think then going back to your point, as far as what we've we seen over the last 18 months with this sort of terrible pandemic period, I, mean, I, I suppose, and I, I'm not sure if it's the right thing to say, but I suppose one of the benefits that have come out of that, this period, is that people have realised that they can't continue to have teams and teams of people in an office, in a location, doing manual work. 
Uh, so they've got to digitize. Uh, and the digitization doesn't just, as I mentioned before, doesn't just mean your, your new web your new web front end uh, for your client facing. It also means digitizing your operations, digitizing your compliance people. So you don't have to rely on those people. So everything needs to be automated uh, so that if, if, God forbid, something like this happens again, we, we can still carry on our business uh, using the technology that we're, we're now, we, we now have. Right. Excellent, Colin. So, uh, Colin, what would you say uh, are some of the new or you know, emerging financial crime risks to global trade uh, caused by the spurt in adoption of cryptocurrencies? And uh, you know, there is a lot of unclear regulation around it in many jurisdictions. Yeah, I mean, crypto is, I suppose, if you're looking at it on, the, on the compliance side, it is probably one of the biggest dangers uh, globally uh, with regard to financial crime. And I think it, it's, it's a big danger because, like you said, there's, there's some, some regulators that have started to regulate. It's still a pretty unregulated industry. Um, and, and not only is it unregulated, but it's also growing rapidly as well. I mean, it expanded exponentially. Um, uh, but still, there's there's less 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 known about it. So um, it's still one of those things that people understand, but to that extent don't understand. And how do we control this beast that's growing every day, going up and down? Um, and I'm sure this will happen for for a few years and, until we get a, until the regulators get a grip on on what it means and how to regulate that. Um, so they've got a much more sort of structured, cohesive approach to to crypto. And whatever the next one is, because there's always going to be something else coming by. Um, but again, I think bring it back to what sort of the AI. So again, with, with these type, whether it's crypto now or a new type of product going forward, this is again where we need to use the technology such as machine learning, etc., where in order to spot those different uh, technologies, different products, etc., that are being traded in the data, the data is there. Whether it's a crypto, whether it's a stock, whether it's a, some goods or whatever. Um, and this is where we use machine learning to, to look at that information and drill down into all those transactions and really just to bring out all the information that you would need in order to, to, to undertake a compliance check, I suppose. So, Colin, I know that you and Pelican uh, have focused a lot on, uh, you know, how AI can be deployed to help banks identify and prevent TVML, that's trade-based money laundering. Uh, can you give us some background on this? Yeah, sure. So um, I think first of all, it, it, it's not just TVM or trade-based money laundering that's causing the issue for, for regulators. So um, what we're talking about is really any sort of crime committed uh, through, through, through trade. And that can be trade-based money laundering. It can be trade-based uh, terrorist financing, which is which has happened quite often. Um, it could be trade-based fraud. We've seen instances in, in Singapore uh, over the last year where there's been invoices uh, continue uh, duplicated and provided to to the banks for financing. Um, it, it can also stretch to wildlife trafficking and human trafficking. So it's a very important task, I think, and this is where the regulators are really sort of uh, stepping in. And I suppose the the, um, the importance of that is, is sort of moving up the ladder of, of priorities for for not just banks but for for regulators across the globe as well. Yeah. So. So we're at Pelican, so just a little bit back, Pelican has been a, a provider of artificial intelligence solutions for over 25 years. Banks uh, into sort of payments uh, and, and other areas of financial crime. And we started looking at how AI can sort of help uh, trade finance consultants or uh, uh, operational people, compliance people, uh, a few years back. Off, off the back of discussions we were having with our clients who using our sanctions screening tool. Um, now, sanction screening tool again uses AI, uses natural language processing, whereby it can read unformatted data. And if you're looking at payment instructions in those days, there's lots of unformatted data where we can use AI to, to read that. And we then looked at trade and some of our clients said, well, if, if you look at a trade business, um, that's, that's, that's a perfect use of, of something like a natural language process, because it's a very, very uh, sort of manual task. And it's a, it's a manual task because it's paper-based. As, as you know, there's, uh, as a, a life cycle of a trade, there's numerous documents that the banks uh, receive, paper-based documents that receive, whether it's the LCs, the bill of ladings, the insurance documents, the invoices, the oranges, et cetera. All of these information, all these documents we get received by the bank, and they're then having to be 
uh, read by the bank, by humans, uh, marked, checked, uh, compared to each other, uh, and then potentially typed into a into a, into some sort of screening tool. Um, so we saw the fact that given us this amount of data and consider that it is all unformatted, this is where natural language processing, we can replace the very mundane task of a the, of the human being reading the document with, with, with artificial intelligence, with, with, with natural language processing. And then the, the other area we looked at, at trade was the fact that there is so much data in a trade uh, because there's different uh, agents, in it, whether it's just the, it's not just the buyer and the seller, it's all the agents in between, the shippers, the insurance brokers, etc. There's a lot more entities, a lot more data is available. Um, so this is in, so when, if you're a compliance person in, in trade, you need an awful lot of domain knowledge in order to understand what you're looking for, first of all, and where you need to look for it. And, and so people, you find people in, in trade finance compliance have potentially been doing that job for, for a number of years. And they've all been uh, sort of trained and gone on some great training courses like this, yourselves and other, other companies provide uh, around compliance. And, and so they have a lot of domain knowledge. So how can we, how can we re replicate that with, with a machine? So building those, those that logic algorithms into the machine learning. So that, that check, instead of taking somebody on an hour, two hours, three hours to, to look, troll through a 20 page document, the machine learning, the machine can run through it in a couple of seconds and, and highlight any alerts. So that's where really, we've been investing a lot of money into R&D, uh, into channel, because we feel that's really, trade finance is, is really an area that needs to be in, innovated uh, with, with this type of technology. Right. So, uh, you know, Colin, have you seen any tangible progress uh, in the last few years on global cooperation to fight, uh, let's say, again, trade-based money laundering in particular? And what do you think uh, can or should be done by the various stakeholders? Yeah, I, I, I think the, 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 the good thing is, I think, as I was mentioned before, I think trade-based money laundering is, is, is moving up the ladder of priorities of the regulators. Um, there's there's a much, much more noise about trade-based money laundering and there were a, f a few years back. Um, although I suppose it's some, some would say it's disappointing where there's still sort of guidelines rather than set regulations that a bank needs to do ABC. There's still guidelines saying this is the best practice. Um, but it, it, it's only moving up and there's more noise. We think that can be sort of witnessed by um, the Financial Action Task Force, uh, which published their white paper a few months back on the, on the uh, trade-based money laundering topologies. Uh, so that was helps. So it's bringing the, the subject matter more to the sort of the priority of not just compliance people, but the, the CEOs, the, the board levels, that they really need to action on that. Um, I mean, as, as far as the industry bodies, the working groups, which I've, I've, I've attended a few recently, um, I think one of the one of the main points, which have been a lot of discussions and uh, in in trade, and how do we, how do we solve the problem of trade based money laundering? And it, it probably goes back to what I started the session with. It, it, it's around data. Yeah. So there is a lot of data. Um, however, each party of the trade has their own piece of data. Yeah. And so how do we, how can, in order to really have a, a sort of comp, uh, thorough check of, of, a, of a trade finance, how can we take, have access to all of that information? Um, even if you, if you take, for example, uh, check in for an over and under invoice, for example, for, for goods. How does a bank that's get, got this, this trade or this application, how can they check to make sure that trade, that trade price is accurate? Uh, they can try to go to Google or they can look at the trades previously, but if they had access for, to the customs department, for example, of all the, every bank's trading in these type of goods. So all goods. In, so the, the sharing of the data, uh, I think, is becoming more and more apparent that in order to tr sort, of, sort of tackle trade-based money laundering on an industry-wide, we need to somehow be able to share the data uh, and get away from, get over the sort of the data privacy rules that are in place. Whether that's uh, sort of private, private to private banks sharing with other banks, uh, so, so a pool of, of market trade prices or goods prices, or whether it's government, public, private, and custom offices sharing information, or, or a combination of it. I think, I think we're getting to a realization now that the only way we're going to really stamp out 
uh, TBML or these type of crime is by having that shared access to that type of data. Right. So Colin, uh, your work involves traveling at least virtually for now uh, to many countries in Asia and being an advocate for stronger compliance. Uh, many regulators are now encouraging the reporting entities to change their approach from technical compliance to effectiveness. So since you have so many banks as customers across the region, how do you see them and other reporting entities becoming more effective? Are you seeing an increase in the use of AI and ML as tools to facilitate faster and more efficient processing of suspicious transaction reports, for example, so that FIUs and regulators in turn can be more effective when passing on the analysis to law enforcement agencies? Yeah, I, I think certainly the, the use of, of AI is becoming uh, much more sort of uh, accepted in, in business. Um, and again, reverting back to what I said, there's no reason why that shouldn't happen. We're seeing the benefits of AI in our everyday lives. Uh, we use it to entertain us. We use it to, to get from A to B when we travel. In some cases, we're using it to save our lives in the hospitals, fantastic things that the, the medical industry is doing. So I think the smarter banks now are really looking at, okay, how do we use this technology to make us more efficient? Yeah. And, and, and I think it's also worth noting, this doesn't mean uh, being smarter means replacing a human being with a machine. So it is, it's not as though we're looking in, in the compliance department in, in 10 years time or 20 years time as just being a, a, a team of robots. Um, it means really using the technology to do the things that uh, I don't know, a human being will take too long to do, or it's just a mundane task that can be quickly done by, by, by a machine, by, by the software. Um, but but the, the human being will still be at the end of that chain to, to look at the alert, to make that final decision. Uh, so what we're sort of, what we're calling sort of augmented intelligence. So let's, let's replace all the, the mundane, boring types of tasks that the, the, the human being has to do, and we'll run those through the AI, get the AI to do that. So then we're presenting the, the, the compliance person, the investigator person, an awful lot more information for him to then provide his SDR to, to the regulator. Um, so I think we're seeing that. And I think the, the other thing we're seeing, and I think one of the things that uh, we like, would like to stress is, is using this technology doesn't mean that you have to replace or rip out all of your old technology in the past. Uh, so the two technologies can, can live side by side. Uh, an example of, of that would be, um, so with sanction screening, for example, where there's a, uh, a number of banks globally have used using sort of sanction screening tools for a number of years. These are sort of rules-based engines. And, and because of the sort of complexity that's been introduced into sanctions over the last few years for, for various sort of government and political reasons, um, that these sanction screening tools are producing a huge number of false positives. So banks are having to put more people into compliance, pe into compliance to do those checks. Um, so, and this is where we can potentially use artificial intelligence to sit on top of those rules-based engines. So we are almost acting as the, the first line. Uh, so when these, when these systems create an alert, artificial intelligence can look at that and, and check them, first of all, and potentially reduce the number before then a human being then needs to look at it. So um, again, this is all about how do we save time? How do we increase uh, the accuracy, reduce costs, uh, and make the whole compliance plan a lot more, a lot more efficient? So uh, Colin, you know, the lack of uh, scale or size uh, or transaction volumes is often cited as a reason for not adopting or inadequately implementing AML technology especially smaller banks. So how do you think smaller banks can actually overcome this automation hurdle? Yeah, th th this is something we, we, we hear a lot. And when I speak to smaller banks, you, you're right, or, or go to potentially the, the sort of smaller smaller financial centers. Uh, the banks will, you know, we just haven't got the, whether it's the funds or the, just the, the whole makeup to, to adopt those type of technologies. And we understand that's a problem. So, but if you swap that into, if, if you were, a perpetrator, if you were a money launderer yourself, um, where would, and you were trying to, to fraud or, or, or do some money laundering, what would you want to do? Would you, would you put it, would you try and money launder through a, a big international bank that's got all these controls? 
or would you try and launder the money through uh, the sort of the small, smaller countries, that the smaller banks that don't have the control? So um, I can understand you know, that they, they can't, maybe can't afford it or don't have the budgets for it. But since, to a certain extent, they are probably the people that are more at risk than the, than the big global banks. Uh, and that's what we've seen again over a number of years uh, where you've seen uh, sort of these sort of crimes being committed through the sort of Southeast Asian sort of countries, smaller countries. Um, so, that, so that is the problem. So it is a case of, well, what do you want to do? Do you, do you want to facilitate uh, money laundering? Do you want to potentially face these global firms, uh, fines? Uh, you also, obviously, the, the reputation is an issue, uh, which is we've sort of again seen with some banks. Um, so it, it's a case, yes, it is a cost. Um, I, I suppose that the cost, like all technology, is coming down. Um, I think one thing which I think we'll see over the coming years is, is more the, the, the use of cloud technology in compliance. I think there's still a bit of a reluctance uh, for, for some banks to, to use cloud, but if, if we can use cloud, that, that reduces the, the whole cost significantly for, 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 for a bank. Um, so we've got to, again, not just the AI, not just the hardware, but we've got to look at cloud as well. Uh, and then we can provide a, a much cheaper uh, solution to, to smaller banks and, and sort of smaller countries as well. But I think I would still say, re re regardless of how the size of the bank, I think every bank needs to have a sizable compliance budget because it could be you that hit, that's hit next. And that's certainly the last thing you want to do. So, uh, Colin, uh, you know, uh, to end uh, this discussion, you know, compliance costs are uh, increasing globally, right? Uh, but at the same time, banks must keep operational costs low to ensure greater profitability and competitiveness. So how can these apparently contradictory issues be addressed? Uh, what are your observations around this? I, mean, I, th I think you're right. I mean, uh, compliance costs are are one of the, the number one uh, factors in, in, in most banks globally. And I think some of this, we, we did some surveys uh, in, in the past, recent past, and, and we looked at these costs and we were quite surprised that essentially 80% of these costs, the compliance costs, is, is spent on people, on, on HR. Uh, and then if you take that further, out of that cost, 90% of that cost is spent on chasing false positives. So that to us gave us an immediate idea, okay, well, the compliance costs are, are actually spent on people wasting their time. Yeah? So by automatically using technology to, to help people not waste their time, that's gonna reduce the, to the compliance costs significantly. Yeah? And some, I mean, some of the, uh, the, the ways we're doing this and sort of going back to maybe, and just talk back, back to our trade, trade-based money laundering on uh, trade finance. Uh, uh, solution again. So if you look at the documentary trade, as, as I mentioned, a huge amount of time is spent by somebody sitting in an office, if they can still sit in an office, looking at lots and lots of documents, looking at a bill of lading, looking at LC, looking at, comparing them, checking them, making sure they're right, making sure that, okay, this port of loading, is this port of loading in this country? I don't, I've never heard this port of loading before. This is new. So all of that thing's being done manually. So it would normally take some, a, a document, um, a couple of hours to be processed. And using nat natural language processing where we can get those documents in, we can automatically extract the data out of those. We can automatically do all the uh, comparisons, checking to make sure the data in the, in the LC is the same as the invoices. We can actually do it, we can do all the uh, formatting of the documents. That reduces the amount of time taken from hours down to minutes and, and seconds. And, and not only that, but also improving the process as well, because we're reading everything. It's a, it's a machine, it reads everything. Um, so that's an important thing. And then again, when we're looking at sanctions, um, so, so looking at uh, uh, dual use goods, uh, looking at over and under invoicing, looking at behavior patterns, all of those things we can use machine learning for. So we're saving amount of time from days, hours, down to minutes and seconds and not needing lots and lots of people to be doing these manual trends. So now we can't have people in the office, or well, maybe not for, for a while anyway. So you don't need that. So people can still be sitting at home or wherever, but all they would get to, all they would be seeing is the, the alerts that the AI, the technology is, is, is providing them. Uh, so that's really gonna save an awful lot of money uh, for the banks and, and again, improve the accuracy as well. So um, I mean, for us as, as an AI uh, technology, 
I think we're, we're just advocating that, that people need to be smarter now. And we, we are using it in their personal lives. Now let's start using it more in our business lives and especially around the, the, in the compliance area as well. Great. On that note, Colin, thank you so much for joining us today. It was fantastic having you on this episode of Fridays with Fintlect and stay safe. No, thanks, Sharish. It's good to be with you. Thank you.